Okay, um, I recommend that you take the outline on chapter six um, off the sheet. And I think if you follow the outline, it makes um, this a lot easier. So the first thing in chapter six is price is controls on prices. And the two that will really be focusing on price ceilings, and that's the maximum price a good can be sold at. So that's the maximum price a good can be sold at. And for a price ceiling to be binding, the price ceiling has to be below the equilibrium, okay? It has to be below the equilibrium. And I call that an upside down house because the ceiling's below the equilibrium. A price floor is the minimum price a good can be sold at. And for that to be binding, it has to be above the equilibrium. So here is a price ceiling. It's not binding because it is above the equilibrium. Okay. Now, if the, if the maximum price is four and they're selling for three, this price ceiling isn't helping any, anyone. So the market is at three. So that's the market would be three and a hundred. All right. The price ceiling is not binding, or sometimes they say it's not effective. It's not being used. For it to be used, it would have to be below the equilibrium. So here is going to be a binding price ceiling. Okay. And one thing you can note is the price ceiling is below the equilibrium, the upside down house, instead of being high, it's ceiling is below and it creates a shortage. Okay. People are demanding 125 ice cream cones, but we're only supplying 75. People are supplying less because the price is less and less suppliers can make profit at that lower price. You'll also notice that at $3, quantity demanded and supply would be somewhere between 75 and 125. So the price ceiling lowers the price, but fewer ice cream cones are being sold. So even though they're trying theoretically to help the ice cream industry, um, in a way, they really are not. All right, rent control, which is... Um, a price ceiling. Now notice, um, if you look at rent control in the short run, there's a very small um, shortage. Now supply is inelastic. Why? Because you're not going to build more apartments or take down apartments in the short run. You have leases and you have to honor your leases. So therefore, even though rents are down and maybe um, some landlords want to stop renting or knock down their apartment building, they have leases. And you could see even demand is not that much greater for the kind of the same reason in the short run, even though you might see a cheaper apartment, you might have an apartment already in a lease and you have to wait for the lease to expire. So in the um, short run, shortage is small. Okay, um, because supply is inelastic. Now let's look at rent control and the price ceiling in the long run. Now again, suppliers at this low rent could stop renting out apartments, knock them down. And now everyone who wants this low rent, their leases are up and they could look for it. And you have this huge shortage. Now the tendency also is if the rent is lower, um, the landlords put less into the building. The quality of the building is not taken care of as much. And the reason being for that is they're making less money um, because rent is lower. So there is your shortage in the long run. All right, now here's a price floor. For the floor to be binding, it has to be above the equilibrium. I mean, because a floor is the minimum price. And so here, the minimum price is two, but if the market's selling it at three, the price floor is not helping. Think minimum wage. The minimum wage is two, but everyone's getting three anyhow. It, it, it's not helping here. So this would be non-binding. When it's non-binding for a floor or a ceiling, you go back to the equilibrium. So it would be three and a hundred, three dollar price and a hundred being sold. All right, the price floor on the upside down house to be binding has to be above. 
we remember anything above the equilibrium will create a surplus. Notice we're supplying 120 and selling 80. All right, creating a surplus of 40. Now, again, we're trying to help um, the ice cream industry um, by you know, putting in this binding price floor, but you can notice that um, they're selling less than they did before, all right? So you have the surplus here and there would be the binding price floor. Right. One of the ones, um, so let me first, before I go into minimum wage, do a quick review. Price floors to be binding have to be above the equilibrium. They increase the price, they increase quantity supplied, they decrease quantity demanded, and they leave a surplus, all right? And they sell less. Now, if I was looking at um, price ceilings, they have to be um, below the equilibrium. All right. They're going to supply less. They're going to leave shortages. And a lot of times, like in gas, they'll have long lines. All right. Now we will go to minimum wage. All right, so minimum wage to be binding, um, since it's a price floor, would have to be above the equilibrium. All right, notice you could have more workers. Why? Because wage is up and more people are going to want to work for that. But businesses are going to demand less workers. Why? Because wages are up and they, they can't be profitable at those wages. So what we would normally call a surplus would now be unemployment. Notice also, if you look at the equilibrium, the original equilibrium, more people would be working. So who does minimum wage help? It helps the workers that still have jobs are getting paid more. But there are people who had jobs who are now out of jobs who do not benefit from the minimum wage. So um, evaluating controls often hurt those in you know, intended to help. Like in this example, it's trying to get people more money, um, a livable wage, but some people are hurt because they're put out of work. And I'm gonna just back up here. And the rent control, it's trying to get people, um, back up. Yeah, and the rent control, it's trying to get people cheaper apartments by putting the rent you know, putting the price ceiling there and, you know, putting a maximum people could pay to rent these apartments. But notice there's a lot of people who want the apartments and very few apartments are available. So that shortage is hurting. Um, the same thing would happen if you just put um, a price ceiling on gas. Um, there'd be a tremendous demand for gas at the lower price, but suppliers would supply less you end up with long lines, sometimes gas stations even out of gas. In both the ceilings and shortages, and we'll learn more about this in the next chapter, they're inefficient. Um, they have what we would call deadweight loss, which is people are forced out of the market by either the increase in price, forcing some consumers out of the market for a price floor, or the lower price ceiling not allowing suppliers to be in the market because they can't afford um, those to make money at those prices. All right, now let's look at the third kind of government controlled taxes. So if you remember rat nest, the T is um, for technology first and then for taxes. So we're gonna have a supply shift. Uh, remember that one, sorry, that was a tax that we don't really need to know. We're gonna have a supply shift here. All right, now, the size of the tax, all right, is the difference between those two lines. It's not from one equilibrium to the other. It's the difference between the two supply curves. And it could be any spot there. It's just the difference between the two supply curves. And that's gonna tell you how much the tax is.
Okay. All right. So um, on this diagram, they decided to look at the difference between the two supply curves right here. If you look, it's 330 minus 280. So the tax is 50 cents. Now, how much does the consumer pay of that tax? All right. Well, the consumer used to pay $3 and is now paying 330. So the consumer would pay 30 cents of that tax. Okay. Now, if the consumer is paying 30 and the total tax is 50, the producer will pay 20 cents and that's your 50 cent tax. So the producer collects 330, 50 cents of that goes to the government and the producer is left with 280. Now, if you look at this rectangle here, that is your tax revenue box, okay? All right, if you look there, it's the height is 50, the base is 90, so it's 0.5 times 90. So the government would make $45 of tax revenue, right? 50 cents a cone, 90 cones, $45. This is your tax revenue box right here. All right. And I mean, I'll just show you this as a little preview. Um, ta taxes like dead weight loss, uh, taxes rather, not like dead weight loss, taxes like price ceilings and price floors create dead weight loss. That's this little triangle here. Okay. And why does this occur? Because at $3, people are buying 90. But when it goes up to 330, it drives like 10 people, 10 consumers out of the market. And therefore, these people are no longer in the market, creating a deadweight loss. Anytime you see deadweight loss, you know there's inefficiency in the market. Okay, let me just erase everything. And we'll do some practice on these um, in class. And we'll work on them again next unit when we're doing consumer and producer surplus. Now, the tax burden, like here, we notice the consumers pay 30 cents and the suppliers pay 20. So here's what's always going to happen. The tax burden is going to fall on either the buyers, if the demand curve is more inelastic, or the suppliers, if their demand curve is more inelastic, it's always going to, the burden is always going to be greater on the curve that's more inelastic. Why? Because inelastic, if price goes up, quantity demanded or quantity supplied changes very little. So therefore, you want to put the burden of the, uh, the tax on the more inelastic curve. Okay. And I think I might have a sample of that. Let's see. And um, and here you're gonna see, like, um, you know, the price that without tax, you could see the price went up tremendously because um, it's an inelastic demand curve. And therefore, um, the burden of the tax is going to fall more on the consumers. Um, this is called tax incidents than on the producers. All right. And here, again, the tax is between, you know, and they don't do this, but let me draw a supply curve that just makes it a little easier. So here is your supply curve. The difference between the two is the total tax you see here, but you can kind of see the consumers are paying, you know, the lion's share. Um, here would be in this red box, 
the consumer's part of the tax, and this bottom here that I'm going to put lines would be the producers. And again, you could look, the demand curve is almost like an eye, so it's an elastic. The supply curve is flatter. Let's see, do I have the reverse in the next slide? And here's your inelastic supply curve. Okay. And here, like the differences in the sellers, you know, are, are paying, you know, most of the burden. And again, I don't know why they don't want to put that other supply, but here would be the new price. And you could tell like here is the consumer tax. And the big box below would be the producers. Okay. All right, that's, that's pretty much um, summarizes um, chapter six for you. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.